Um, if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 2? So reading from verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in the spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all, and this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? So Father, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that, um, that you'll open our hearts, you'll open our eyes, you'll open our ears. So we may see you, we may hear you, and we may know you more. We pray that you uh, speak through your servant, speak in me, speak through me, and especially speak in spite of me, and help us to see you in a new way and be changed. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there are two prayers that I think that I have prayed pretty consistently throughout my life. The first prayer is, Thy kingdom come. That's something that um, we've just prayed it just now in the Lord's Prayer. We seem to pray it every week. Um, and often I've prayed that prayer, Thy kingdom come, Lord. I pray that when, it's, um, when I see moments of crisis in the world, you know, when I see moments of great tragedy happening, when I see the world starting to fall apart, I pray, Thy kingdom come. Because what I mean when we say, thy kingdom come, is I'm asking God, please, make yourself known in the world. Make yourself known in this situation. Please, Lord, we don't know what to do, but we ask you to rule and reign in this situation. We want to see your redemption permeate the entire world. This is what we do when we pray, thy kingdom come. And I've noticed that this is a prayer I often pray for other people, you know. Thy kingdom come there, thy kingdom come there. Now there's a second prayer that I pray, and I really, I mean, I haven't prayed this as often, but I feel it's happened in more significant moments in my life, and I've really hated having to pray this prayer. And that prayer is, Lord, please take my world apart. It's from a Jars of Clay song that I really grew up loving. But um, this is the prayer I often say, when I've hit rock bottom and I don't know what to do with myself. Lord, please take my world apart. <coughs> it's, I pray this prayer when I have needed some sort of divine intervention in my life, when I've run out of resources of trying to figure out my own situation. It's a prayer I've made that when I'm desperate and need a radical reshaping of my life, I say, take my world apart. But if I can avoid it, I never want to say this prayer. <laughs> because usually I'm pretty happy where I am. You know? I'm, usually I'm pretty fine. I'm, I, I like where I am. I'm pretty comfortable with where I live. Or at least, you know, even if things aren't going that well, I'm used to the life I'm living right now. You know? And, you know, better the devil you know. <laughs> when John first announced his series last week, I had heard him talk about it a few weeks earlier. Um, talking about, you know, when everything falls apart, that's when the adventure begins. These prayers started swimming in my mind. I don't know why. But I've come to realize that, you know, when everything falls apart, the adventure begins. 
Thy kingdom come, take my world apart. These two prayers are intricately linked. One cannot really exist without the other. I think the reason we often don't see the kingdom of God coming in power and might in our lives, the reason we don't see thy kingdom come, is because we're so afraid to say the other prayer and take my world apart with it. But the kingdom of God is in the business of disruption. I'm convinced that when the kingdom of God comes into our world, our worlds get torn apart. And that's a great and wonderful thing. In our passage today, I see three ways in which the kingdom of God disrupts our lives. And the first is that the kingdom of God disrupts our home. If you read with me again in chapter 2, a few days later, Jesus again entered the Capernaum, and the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. He preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And since they could not get through, they made an opening through the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Son, your sins are forgiven. In verse 1, we read that Jesus had come home. We never really think that Jesus had a home, you know? We never really, the idea doesn't tend to enter our minds. But uh, as I was reading um, a bunch of commentaries this week, um, especially N.T. Wright, he argues that, no, here is the evidence that probably Jesus did have some place that he called home. Maybe it was not a home he owned, but it was some place that he had gotten familiar enough. It was a place, it was a center upon which he could launch into the rest of his ministry. And I think that when he came back to Capernaum, if you read in chapter 1, he had been through all the neighboring villages. He had been preaching the gospel. He had been healing the sick, casting out demons. He had been proclaiming the kingdom of God is near. And I think that when he came home, what he wanted was rest and recuperation. And the last thing he probably wanted to do when he came home was to entertain a whole bunch of people, preach the gospel to them, and watch as a roof comes tumbling down. <laughs> and I'm, this is a sentiment I'm sure we can all sympathize with. You know, we don't like being interrupted at home. Home is where I'm allowed to sit in my sweatpants and watch whatever I want for as long as I want and relax. Home is, you know, where I'm allowed to 100% be myself, where I don't have to be on for other people, you know. And I will fight tooth and nail to preserve home, you know. I will turn away solicitors. I will intentionally tell people I'm busy when I'm not, really. I will come up with every excuse possible so I can be in my sweatpants and I can watch my Netflix. Just leave me alone. I've only been a homeowner, you know, for three weeks. <laughs> and I've already started to feel, you know, this sense of protectionism about my home. You know, don't mess with my home. You know, I'm installing new security systems. I'm, you know, putting up, making sure the house is lit properly at night. You know, uh, I'm assessing all the security threats in my home. It's been three weeks. This is only going to get worse. <laughs> but basically, I'm doing everything in my own power to make sure no one else gets in. And I feel that's often how we approach our home and our lives. We do as whatever we can to make sure as little people get in as possible. So when Jesus is at home, I'm sure maybe it's not as bad as me, but a similar feeling must have been in his mind. I just want to rest. I just want to recuperate. But the kingdom of God doesn't let Jesus rest in the sanctity of his home. First, crowds gather in such large numbers that there's no space left in the house. You know, rather than Jesus resting, he had to entertain a whole host of people, make sure they had food and preach to them and talk to them. The absolute opposite thing of getting some rest. And then to make matters worse, four people rip up his roof <laughs> and drop a paralyzed man down. That's a homeowner's nightmare. <laughs> and I think at any point, 
in this, sto in this story, Jesus could have said, enough's enough, please go away. He could have said it when one person showed up at his house, or maybe when 10, or when it was so full that people were standing outside the doors trying to get in. He definitely could have said it when his roof came down and said, everybody out, get off my lawn. <laughs> Because every part of what home and the sanctity of home had been disrupted. He could have said no at any of these points. I know that because we've all said no when the kingdom of God shows up for much less reasons. We've said no because, you know, it messes up with our schedules. We've said no because it doesn't interest us. It's not fun. We've said no because family comes first, or our business, or our careers, our hobbies, our interests our goals. We said no to the kingdom because of the simple inconvenience it causes to our lives. But Jesus, out of all of us, had the most legitimate reason to say so. But he didn't. Because he understood this is how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God does not fit neatly into our schedules. It can't be kept at a safe distance from our homes because the work of the kingdom is too important. The kingdom of God will disrupt our lives at home because what the kingdom brings is a forgiveness of sins, the healing of the sick and the lame, the feeding of the hungry, the redemption of the world. Jesus recognized that his roof caving in was not just a major inconvenience in his life, but it was the kingdom of God breaking into a broken world. Without the roof caving in, there, are, there wouldn't have been a miracle. The man would not have walked. Without the roof caving in, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without the roof caving in, the kingdom of God passes by. And perhaps this is precisely why the kingdom of God doesn't come in power in our own lives. Because we're unwilling to let the roof cave in. We try to keep the kingdom at a safe, manageable distance. We choose to devote our energies to our family, to our work, to everything else first, and whatever else is left behind, that's what we'll give to the kingdom. We try and compartmentalize our life. We try and confine our religious life to Sunday, to our private devotions. And so the kingdom passes us by. Because it's only when we allow the roof to cave in that we see the kingdom come in glory. So the kingdom of God first disrupts our home. But more importantly, I think the kingdom of God disrupts our religion. Immediately after Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven, we see that the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Almost immediately, the call of blasphemy comes out when Jesus forgives sins. Because I think the kingdom of God disrupts our religion. Religion has this nasty habit of being extremely comfortable with where they are at right now. With being fine with the status quo. In Jesus' day, the teachers of the law were, you know, um, were people who had devoted their entire lives to the study of scripture. They were the ones who discussed theology amongst themselves. They were the ones who defended orthodoxy. And they weren't necessarily bad people. They were just the gatekeepers of religion. And their chief goal was to make sure that, you know, when we present this religion to you, you will see it as an ordered and reasonable and sensible faith. They wanted to make what might be a scary approach to God comfortable and familiar. And their chief sin, as Jesus points out time and time again, was not that they didn't believe in God, because they did believe in God. But they, had, but they simply believed that God couldn't do anything new. When Jesus said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, they threw a wrench into the nice, neat, systematized religion that the teachers of the law had built up for themselves. Because in their mind, this Jesus couldn't forgive sins, only God could forgive. And only God can forgive once the offender had shown enough repentance and, you know, we can tell how someone has shown enough repentance. Here are a bunch of steps to show that you are truly sorry for what you have done. And once you have done all those steps, 
then, we'll, then we know that God has forgiven you. But the kingdom of God was showing something new. Instead of all these steps, instead of all these methods, Jesus was declaring that if you come to the Son of God, if you come to the Son of Man, you will be forgiven. You will be healed. You will be restored. There will, there's no more a complicated system. Now we can just turn to Christ and be forgiven. The kingdom of God has shown up. And we should all rejoice. But of course it is our nature that whenever our religion gets disrupted, we fight and rebel back against it. The religious authorities, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the scribes, we all know they will remain Jesus' opponents until he's on the cross at Calvary. Because they could not accept that their world was being disrupted. During the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, they were opposed by the established church because they simply believed that we should believe in Scripture alone and not the rest of the stuff we have invented. On Sunday, we got to, last Sunday, we got to um, see a great play um, by B.J. Johnson about the life of John Wesley. And he reminded me that, you know, John Wesley, this great man of faith who preached the gospel to so many people, he was rejected from preaching in many churches in England because he preached a radical notion that what matters most is not the liturgy, what matters most is not religiosity, what matters most is not the church. What matters most is we've been forgiven by God and saved from our sins. For that reason, he was not allowed to preach in church. And it's easy to look back and say, well, obviously, you know, this Jesus guy, he ended up on the right side of history. Obviously, Martin Luther ended up on the right side of history, and obviously, John Wesley were right, was right. And all these religious authorities, they were just stupid for not being able to see what was so plainly obvious. It would be easy to say, obviously, our faiths today look a lot more like Jesus. Obviously, our faiths look more like Martin Luther, like John Wesley, and much less like the teachers of the law. Obviously, we won't be so stupid as to reject the kingdom of God when it stares us in the face. But I think that inbuilt into our DNA is a radical resistance to change, a natural inclination to get comfortable where we are. I think the church is an expert in making sure the roof doesn't cave in, in making sure the walls don't come down, and making sure the boat doesn't get rocked. The church over time has found itself very capable of making sure nothing disrupts the life of the church. We've become experts in maintaining the status quo. And I don't think we're immune to that at the harbor either. I think one of the ways, as I've thought deeply about it, one of the ways we've begun to be like that more and more is that there's this language that we start using around here and we start call, we're starting to call the harbor our church. Now don't get me wrong. I don't think there's nothing in and of itself wrong with saying this is our church. Harbor is our church. But I think the more and more we've said this is our church, the more and more we've stopped saying this is the church for the world. The more and more we start, we said this is our church, the less and less interested we got in going out and preaching the gospel to all nations. We started to get comfortable where we are. We started to say we've arrived at whatever destination we said we were going to arrive in, and that there's no need to grow, no need to reach out. The more we said our church, the less our biggest concern is how are we reaching the gospel and more did I get my favorite donut? <laughs> the more we said Harvard Church is our church, the more comfortable we become with not having to step beyond the walls. And I think we would be able to do that, except, guess what? The kingdom of God would pass us by. We would miss this disruptive kingdom. This disruptive kingdom that reminds us that Jesus Christ has come to seek and save the lost. This disruptive kingdom that reminds us that this church isn't for us. 
but it is so that the gospel may be preached to the world. John Wesley, um, again, he's saying, our main purpose in life is not to be good at religion, but it's to preach the gospel to all nations and to save souls. That's why we're here. What is, what's most important isn't our religious practices, isn't our musical style, isn't the quality of our preaching. It's not the church building, it's definitely not the coffee and donuts, or the carpets, or how comfortable our pews are. But this kingdom reminds us that what we've been called to do is to carry the gospel out into the world. And we don't get there unless we let the roofs cave in. So the kingdom disrupts our homes. The, dis the kingdom disrupts our church. But there's a reason the kingdom disrupts these two things. And it's because of the kingdom has come to disrupt the world we live in. A world which seems hell-bent on destroying itself. A world defined by wealth or a lack of wealth, in which some people throw away food while others remain hungry. This is the world the kingdom has come to disrupt. A world in which we, pre we pretend that justice, that revenge is the same thing as justice, that the only way to peace is through war, in which more people are sold into slavery than ever before, in which the accumulation of wealth is equated to our worth. This is the kingdom, this is the world the kingdom has come to disrupt where our physical appearances define our beauty, in which survival of the fittest, look out for yourself, win at all costs, these are the maxims we tell ourselves, this is the kingdom. This is what the kingdom has come to disrupt. The kingdom of God has come here to disrupt all these things and set about a new way that leads to life and life everlasting. When the kingdom of God showed up at Jesus' home that day, a man walked, a man was healed, a man was forgiven, a man found life. That's what happens when the kingdom of God shows up. When the kingdom of God shows up, forgiveness becomes our everyday language. We see redemption, we see healing, we see restoration, we see what true justice looks like. We'll know comfort, we'll know peace, joy and love, and life and life abundantly. The kingdom of God is here to tear down the powers of evil, disarm the wicked, protect the weak, and make humble the mighty and strong. And the kingdom of God is here to proclaim salvation through the saving blood of Jesus Christ alone, who died for our sins, rose again, and is coming back to bring full redemption to this broken world. And we will see this kingdom but only if we let it disrupt our lives. Only if we're letting, willing to let the kingdom of God shape and mold us, break us out of where we are comfortable and safe. Only if we allow the Holy Spirit to take us away from what is familiar and lead us to the broken places of the world. Then we will see the kingdom of God, then we'll experience its power. Then we'll experience salvation, redemption, and hope. And the question is, are we willing to pray those two prayers that I mentioned at the beginning? Thy kingdom come and take my world apart. For the two go hand in hand. Are we willing to let God cave our roofs in? Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we confess to you this day that so often we've let your kingdom pass us by. We've become content with being comfortable. We've chosen to remain where it's safe and familiar. We have been afraid to let our roofs cave in and chosen to trust in our own self-preservation rather than to trust you to rule in our lives. Forgive us and teach us how to live in your disruptive kingdom. Empower us by your spirit to go out from this church and find you and your kingdom in the world. Interrupt us and open our eyes so we might see your kingdom in all its glory. And may we be forever changed.
In your name we pray. Amen.